All right, we are back. Actually, we moved out into the into my garage. Um, this is a bench uh, mounted uh, uh, drill press here. Here's our sheath dry from the dyeing process. And we've got two needles here. Uh, a smaller, these are both, uh, I bought these both at Tandy, um, but they're, they're a smaller uh, needle that they sell, uh, a harness needle. Don't buy glovers and needles. Glovers needles are sharp. Harness needles are dull. And we because we're not poking holes with the needle itself, we're poking holes, well, normally you're not in stitching, normally you're using it all. Because we're not poking holes with the needle itself as we're sewing, um, we use a harness needle, not a glovers needle. So once we get the right needles uh, in our hands, oh, uh, there's two sizes of those at Tandy, um, uh, zero and double zero or triple zero. I'll have to look that up. I'll, I'll put it on the bottom, those sizes there. Um, but what you want, you don't need many of these bigger needles for uh, stitching itself. I use them just for punching holes, this one here. This one here is actually the needle that we will be using to sew with. We'll use two of these. But um, I use this for a couple of the holes, and I'll explain that down the road here. So the first thing we're going to do is um, chuck this up into our drill press. Turn this the right way. Adjust you here. Into the drill press here, finding our chuck key. Let's check that. Pretty good. This drill press has some run out, so I'm gonna have to replace it pretty soon. I want to get a nice bench top model for actually inside. But uh, this is out in my garage where I do other stuff, and I always put a fresh piece of tape on here, and I'm gonna be doing leather. This plate is again steel, and as we talked about with steel, um, it will die. It will darken your leather, so protect it and keep an area clean. Um, so I cleaned off the plate itself. Here is the leather that we're gonna be doing. We're actually gonna drop this plate. And we're going to do, get that out of the way, we're going to do the um, dangler first here. So we have to punch all these holes first. All you're doing is punching holes. We're usually using a drill press. An arbor press would work, I think, um, but the drill press works too as well, and that's what I have. So um, that's what definitely what I'm going to use. And again, this is not an expensive drill press. I was given this drill press <laughs> by a friend. Um, and I'm sure it was just a Harbor Freight version when he bought it. So nothing, you know, crazy good there um, by which you can afford. Because uh, it doesn't need a lot of pressure or anything like that. Not necessarily loud. I apologize on this on the video. Um, and I'll try to talk over it. If it doesn't sound very good, then uh, I'll put some music over it or something like that. But what we're going to do is we're just going to punch all these holes. We're opening the sheath up. What you don't want to do on a pouch sheath here is punch it. You're going to punch the holes through and then go through the front part. So I always open this up. I put my hands behind it for support. And I'm just going to make sure that uh, I keep my fingers out of the way. The first thing I'm going to do, though, is line up where I want this to drop, which is right about here. And I want to make sure it's absolutely not kicked to the left side or to the right and vertical. So once I have that, I hold it. Turn it on and go to work. Take your time, doesn't need a lot of pressure. So that's it for that. All those holes have been punched there, which make corresponding holes, of course, on the inside. So we need to chase that with our stitch groover. Let me get out my own light here. There we go. Uh, chase that with my stitch groover when I get it inside, and I'll show you how to do that in just a minute. But what we're going to do is move on to the 
let me raise my plate back up. There's no magic spot, I just kind of get it close. Now what I did do to modify this plate slightly, these plates come with uh, these two big oblong dudes here for mounting uh, vices on. It comes with a big hole in the middle. That big hole, if I use that, tends to leave marks on the back of the sheet, especially if it's damp. I don't want that. So I drilled, a, right next to it, I drilled a very small hole. Hang <laughs> sorry, hear how that thing makes noise. I drilled a very small hole on the plate so that just my needle will go in there in case it goes through. You can, you know, just put an old scrap piece of leather below there, but if you go through that and you hit the plate itself, it's gonna, you know, kind of damage your needle up. So maybe make sure it's really thick or set your stop or do whatever, but this is what works for me. Now, when I start going on this, I'm not going to start in the very last hole, or am I going to start in the very first hole? There's a reason for that. Um, I'm gonna start on the second hole and make all my holes with this larger needle uh, there and then come back and drill, uh, drill, punch really, the last hole and first holes with the smaller needle because as you're stitching, you do a double stitch. These stitches go back through and so each stitch gets sort of an X on it, uh, like that. Stitch back, out, stitch back, out. And that's how you get going. But if the last one and the first one, the last one and the first one, they get back stitched, so it loops back around. So it doesn't go, it doesn't X through, it gets a loop through. So a smaller hole there will look a lot better, okay? And if that didn't make any sense, then just hold on until we start stitching and I'll, I'll, I'll iterate that, okay? All right, here we go again. So what I'm running into here is trying to show you guys here. Let me, in fact, let me move. It. I think that will help maybe. I want to, I want to make sure that this, the pouch sheath, because it, it's going to bulge a little bit here, because that's where we had it wet form. It is imperative that when you're doing this process, this stays absolutely flat on the plate here. If it kicks up, those stitches will go out and come out wide in the back of your sheath which is no good at all. I've, I've made some mistakes doing that. You don't want it to kick up like this. You don't want it to kick up like that. It has to stay flat. I think this is a better viewing angle for you guys. So I'm gonna get going again, but uh, I just wanted to mention that that is the most important thing if you're gonna use a real press. Here we are. Oh, if you do start over and you open up, okay, I'll make sure all my holes are going, which they're going just fine. We did, we, we, we looked so carefully. If you do start, make sure you set it back to where you think it's gonna be, turn on your drill press, and then you know slowly go into this and make sure that you get no resistance, that it's, it's meeting that same hole again. So you're completely lined up. And then keep lined up, let me get you in view here, there we go. Keep lined up all the way to the edge, the end of your sheath. Sometimes it wants to roll in and roll out. And the last thing you want is to miss your welt inside here. Then it's got no purpose to have a welt if the stitch is inside the welt. So just keep that all aligned. And, and what's good is that you, you, by this point, you've trued all this up. So it should feel flush out there. So what I do is I tend to do, let me try to get my thumb in the picture. Can I do it? Yeah. Um, I tend to you know, hold it flat like this and then run this thumb along the side at all times, making sure that it is flush out there. So here we go again.
So that is the first row of stitches. Again, starting not at the last stitch, starting one back, and, and, and ending here, not at the very first stitch, but one back, okay? Now if we look in here, everything is perfectly aligned, and all of our stitch line has gone perfectly straight back here, okay? Now if it looks a little off there, if the reveal is a little off, and it probably is, is when I sanded this, this part was, the back was left a little fat, which is, which is just fine. I'll, I'll teach you how to do all that when we get back in the shop here. Okay, so I'm going to do the second st set of stitches, stitch holes right now, um, and I will flip, switch over to this smaller needle. Ooh, ooh. <laughs> after I throw it around a little bit, I'll switch over to this smaller needle right after that. So here we go. I wanted to pause that really quick. Remember, I had to sort of move those holes around. I think this will show this a little bit better. I moved that hole to the very end. It was like right there, which would have left like, I don't know, a sixteenth of stitch line. I want it to go to the very, very end here and then match this, this hole here if I can. So I moved it a little using that stylus and you can see those holes that are tapped and they're going to start going a little duller here. All I did is I had to move this over like, I don't know, a 30 second. It's not much, but I have to sort of compensate for that just slightly so i go back like i don't know 10 stitches doing a little bit less a little bit less a little bit less until it matches this five stitch per inch marker that i've been using okay um five stitch per inch is what i was using the entire time uh which is good perfect for uh, uh eight to ten ounce leather and, and right around there you might want to go to six stitches if it were a little bit thinner than five stitches or excuse me uh seven stitches if it were even thinner but normally five stitches per inch if you're just doing a sheath you're going to be perfect with this especially brush crusher sheath if it's thinner then then compensate properly okay <laughs> So we look at all these holes here, there we go. And so they're all well within the welt. And, and look, you can see, because because we measured it out and we took our time, it's eighth inch, then eighth inch in the gap, and a little over eighth inch out here when we sand that back. To finish it, it will be perfect. All right, so we take our, the big needle out. It's a double lot, I'm pretty sure. And this is a single lot. I always turn it the wrong way. <laughs> now this wants to chuck up kind of weird. It wants the, the two teeth want to grab it before the three do, so I have to kind of dance with this a little bit until I get it seated, or it will really start to spin on me. Let me check. Oh yeah, look at that go. <laughs> That's not right. That's what it's it. No. No, that's even worse. Come on now. It's what you get for having like Harbor Freight tools, you know. But it's what I could afford. I just, like I said, I just need to, I got the, I have the money. I just need to replace it. There we go. A little bit of run out, like I said, but it'll work for what we're doing here. Okay, all we have are a couple of holes to punch. Again, the very end and the very beginning. And this will make sense in a little bit. So I'm just going to go ahead and do it.
asshole took so long as I was trying to get you guys in view here. Let me back you up. Please excuse any mess you see around my garage. I use it for all sorts of home improvement, honeydew lists and stuff like that. So, but that's it. Um, and we're, we're, we're really good here. We've got straight lines all the way down. We didn't go, we didn't in, in, encroach on our Makehurst mark, which would have been sad. We're close, but we're not bad off at all. Um, I didn't mention this. You might even notice that it's a little darker right there in that part of the sheath. Uh, it's because I dampened the sheath so that it would open and close neatly. When you, when you first dye that, um, and then let it dry, it is going to pull some of the natural oils out of the leather. So it's going to get a little more stiff, which is fine for down the road. But when you're trying to open it and close it, it might feel a little bit more stiff. So take your time. Also, I'll make sure you get this in shot. When you're doing a pouch sheath, you see how that, that, that dangler loop here wants to back you up a little more, wants to grab a hold of your plate. So you might want to add a little bit of water there too. Okay. Uh, just a very little bit because it's still the, the die has not been sealed yet and so uh, it might run on you so that's that let's head inside and i will show you uh, the next step which is going to be to stitch this belt loop on first we have to stitch this on first or else um we can't get to here to put the glue on it we can't you know once it's closed you, you can't get your needle through there so we have to do that first then we're ready to stitch and then we're, we're almost there we have to finish the edges and put a little finish on everything and we're done so we're getting really close stick with us and and, and keep working hard take your time we're back we're inside from the garage here um <laughs> i want to show this to you i uh, told you how that dries um it, it loses some of its natural oils this is the dangler after it dried and it's got a quite a smiley face going there um and it will bend right out that's fine but uh, you know that, that's kind of how um, hard that will start to get. Uh, so w the, our next step, we're going to set the dangler aside for now. Okay. Our next step is to, um, like I said at the end of the last step, is to stitch this on. I don't glue this. You can. You absolutely can. However, remember you are grain on grain here. So and that's not what you want. So you would need to rough this up here and rough up the inside of the sort of shield look uh, there and, and then press those together. I don't find that I need it for this application. It's stitched all the way around. Um, so I, I just don't, I don't do it. Maybe that's wrong, but I have not had a failure there yet. So I've been doing it this way for three years, which isn't a ton of time when you consider some of the guys out there, but uh, I'd worry, I'd definitely change if I had something else going. All right, so first thing we need to do then, we've got a couple of kind of weird things before we actually do the stitching part. Um, we have to, I'm gonna put a little bit more water just on the inside. I'm not gonna dampen the outside. I just need this leather to sort of um, be a little softer. I'm gonna check to make sure you guys are still on frame. Yeah, you're good. I need it to be a little bit softer there, okay? Let me close my door here. should do it a little bit here okay yeah oh you know what i'm gonna dampen i want you guys see because i didn't you know, to your screen you know what and i say that you know what and you say what you know, i'm sure you don't do that all right so um i bumped into something here all right so i need to just use my manual stitch groover and just connect the dots here go around I'm gonna do this a couple times, make sure I get a good depth and chase these lines back. And again, this is really important. This um, stitch really needs to lay flush and I'm not removing much strength, remember, because I'm on the flush side. If this were grain side, I probably wouldn't be going this deep. Um, let me adjust my light, that seems pretty harsh. Okay. I need that to lay really thin. This is my, let me grab a chunk if I've got one, I'll pull it off here. This is my, the size um, thread I'll be using and it needs to lay in that hole and it does. Because what I don't want it to do when I'm inserting the knife, again when this is closed that'll be sort of tight. I don't want it to run over the stitches and every time start to um, rub, rub on those stitches 
and wear them away and they'll eventually break. So they have to sit below the surface, okay? Another thing you can do if you want to be really careful, I, t I do this only for snaps though, is I, I take a piece of leather that I've skived, just a piece of flesh that's a couple of um, uh, ounces thick. Let me see if I've got one in my scrap bin. Yeah, it's not big enough, but you'll get the point. Just like this thick. And then I glue it over the stitches. And that creates sort of a liner. This is why Paul Long lines a lot of his stitches. One, it just looks a lot better and it's really nice. And he does sh uh, sheaths for pretty high-end knives. Um, I'm like in the mid-range of customs of what I do. And, and so my price point is such that um, a bushcrafter knife doesn't need that sort of protection. It doesn't need... Um, you know, calf skin or deer hide. I could do it, but it would add a lot, it would add cost. And this is quite expensive enough um, because of the custom work, which is just a lot of time. In it. Okay, so here are the two needles that I'm going to be using uh, here in just a minute. Um, and these are, I believe, zero needles. Again, I'll check on that. Um, I always chase around with those and just punch those holes out because what happens when I when I um, run that stitch groove is that I lose my where the holes were that I just can't see them not that that's super important but when you're doing the stitching you'll see how it's really nice to be able to see those holes so I go around quickly and just poke those back through and I will do one more thing before I start stitching which is make the same groove lines right here. Oh, you're going to see the, the sheath color a little off. Remember, I've dampened this. And also, when it flexes, we're not there to the, the quite the right color yet. When we are, the color it's going to be, when we put our tan coat on at the very end, that's going to change the color a little bit. So don't freak out if you're seeing a little, little color differential. Some of that's just going to be the dampness from the sheath, from adding it down here and stuff like that. Now, if it's way off, if it's modeled, or something, you've got a problem. Something went wrong in your dye process. So the next step that we will do is to chase the lines on the back of here. Now, this is where it is very important to have been careful in marking the stitches and, and running the grooves when you set the stitches on this side, okay? Now, before we... I do things... <laughs> I realize now from filming these how just ADD I am. I'm on medication for it and it, it really does help, but uh, I'm jumping around. You're like, why are you using a modeling brush right now and putting water in those grooves? Um, doing damp, 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 barely damp stitching for me, I find settles the stitches in a little bit better, but also I need to run the over a stitching wheel over these holes because I want those to lay back down and it, and it really preps them to channel the sheath, excuse me, the stitch is the thread, that's what I'm trying to say, it, to ready to channel the thread into those holes and it just looks a lot neater. It kind of looks like it's been stitched, you know, it's like an invisible thread or something at this point and the reason you do that is so that it's ready, uh, sort of set up, you've sort of created a super highway of uh, inviting the sheath to get in there and lay down and look good. We're going to do that again when we get on this side. So now we'll do what I originally said we were going to do. Just chase those lines. I'm doing this backwards to make sure all these lines match up. And I've got a little bit of wide there. And rock that to make that up. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to start right here. You have to be so careful with this. Just have a steady hand. Take your time. Do practice on scrap leather if you need to. Okay? I'm going to punch out that little bit of leather so you can see it all come out at the right time. This is going to come out in chunks. It's not going to come out in a nice little curly cue because you've, you've, you've disrupted the curly cue by punching the holes in it. Okay? Here we go. We touch off on that first hole. I'm going to bring that just to one side. Make sure we're just connecting all these dots. A little bit of left or right is okay. A little bit. And I mean a little bit. Like a 30 second or something. 
I don't need to come back, lean in. Like I'm just going to stop. I'll tell you why. I know it's a little bit fat right here. When I ran this side, I chased this side, and you can see how if you're, I don't know if you can see that, but it, it kind of goes a little wider there. I'm going to skip over that little part right there. Come down here where it's touching off. Touch off again. Being really careful. And I set up my own thumb as a stop. I, I don't want to go off of here or else I get a line and it's, oh, it's just awful. Again, that's okay if you want that. I've, I've connected a lot of my stitch grooves all the way around. I think that looks cool, but it better be intentional. You know what I mean? You better make sure that it, it, that's what your customer wants or that's the look that you wanted. Now, does that match? That one does, that one does, that one does. If I leaned in it, it would. Let's use the manual stitch groover and connect these dots manually. Go slow, one at a time. Following that edge. And how I'm doing that, so you see how that edge chases now, nice and clean, all the way around, okay? How I'm doing that is I take this finger, I put it against, and so it becomes like this part, the, the, the gap, the thing that keeps the right gap. I take this finger, put it here, I hold on with these fingers like a pencil, and that finger becomes my guide to run down evenly, okay? If you've got a good hand, if you have a steady hand, I do not. I have a fairly steady hand, but not like artists do and stuff. You watch these guys that can just lean in there and just put a dot or something, you know, right where they want it. Dan Coster's that way. <laughs> I think he only owns one of these. <laughs> I've watched him put, she, he's like, oh, I'll just run that line around there. But I think he, I think he teaches graphic arts for a living. He's like me. He's a professor for, for a living. Um, I, I think he teaches graphic arts for a living. He might be an adjunct though, so I think he does knife work. To, to supplement his income. And thank God, <laughs> thank God for adjunct professors or the education system would shut down because they're damn near doing it out of the goodness of their own heart. I'm on a soapbox because I'm a professor. Sorry about that. Adjunct professors are the part-time ones. They get paid so much less. They usually have to drive and prepare at the last minute. <coughs> and they teach a lot of the classes, sadly. Because we don't value educate. I'm still on that soapbox, aren't I? I'll stop. I started the second hole here because I wasn't. I'm not able to go up here and get a good line. I'm not going to try. I'm just going to start dragging this down. I think I've probably said go slow and take your time like a hundred times in this video, but this is the part where when you're making this is make or break it time in a way because one you can't fix some of these mistakes you just can't without them looking like doo-doo um and again if you're just making a sheath for you and it's a practice sheath then hey make it but there now those are can even be a little bit offset because i'm going to chase this around like this now before i do that where to go I've got a little artist brush here. I'm going to put a little water right in that groove to help me chase those groove lines around. I have also have to dye this. I have to dye this because I've just taken all the dye off. It sits fairly on the surface. You can still see it's, it's darker. But, you know, I've pulled a, I don't know, 32nd, maybe a little more than that off of there. Almost a 16th. Um, and so I, I just pulled off the material that was dyed. I've got to put dye back on. Some people think that oil dye penetrates deeper than spirit. Some people think that spirit penetrates deeper than oil. I think oil goes on nicer. Um, it's a little bit smoother, maybe, but it's also a lot more expensive, and I don't see a difference at the end. It's just like a little bit easier for me. You know what I like about the spirit-based is I'm able to use um, multiple coats and do like modeling effects and do different things. So that's why I choose it. Again, do what works for you. Ian Atkinson, who has a lot of really good videos too on YouTube, a lot of good videos. Um, he swears by oil dye. Says his life was, you know, sucked. <laughs> kind of, you know, uh, he was having trouble with his dyeing process when he was still doing spirit based. I didn't have that problem, but I don't argue with him. 
I'm not saying he's wrong by all means. Everybody's experience is their own experience to a certain degree. And so if Ian's getting really good results, I don't care if he's getting it with, you know, a uh, dive aid from Bark, then do it, man. Do it. To a certain degree, this is utilitarian in nature. She certainly, especially a pouch, she made to do a job. We're adding some aesthetics because that's uh, that's what humans do. You know, if we can make it pretty we, and we have the time, we tend to make it pretty, which is great. Separates us from other animals, although not all of them. Um, but it just needs to do its job. And so if he's got a magic marker and it's making awesome looking cheese, then, you know, sharpie it up, bro. I don't care. Okay. All right. We see that. So we've got really good lines here we've, and they match here and we're rocking and rolling. We're moving fast. So time to actually start stitching. We made our, our stitch groove marks. Everything matches back up. We will do one more thing. <laughs> Here's the ADD again. We will do one more thing before we move on. I need a nice piece of clean cloth. I've got old t-shirts here that I tend to use. So let me cut a little piece here. I'm going to use some tan coat and he, there's a reason for that too. Once I stitch this down, once I stitch this down, um, oh, I'm going to lay those down too. So I'll talk while I'm doing that. Once I stitch this down, I don't have any um, leather protection, any surface coating um, where this attaches here yet. And if I stitch it down, I'll never have any there, which is unacceptable uh, you know, in an end product that's meant to go out into the wilderness. Okay, uh, like a pouch sheath. I'm going to use tan coat because I just don't see a problem with it. It's made by the Phoebings Company. Uh, it's a really good product. A lot of guys use them. I also use from time to time, especially if I know this is going to be a really hard working sheath. I use Montana, Here's Montana Pitch, Pitch Blend. Blend. <laughs> you do not need this big of a container. This is a 14 ounce tub. The Montana Pitch Blend people are at treatleather.com, but they're really, I, I've never had any trouble with them. It seems like a really cool company. Um, this is my second container in three years and I liberally coat stuff liberally coat stuff it just really lasts it's made of uh, pitch mink oil and beeswax don't hesitate to use this it's really good and what I would do then is get some of my fingers there rub it along here rub it right here really get it to settle in I might put it in front of my um, my fan let that dry and then boom stitch it down so I know that's been coated it's usually it's the beeswax really that's doing a lot of the sealing and the pine pitch but we're gonna use tan coat today a little chunk of my old sleeve here probably still smells like yeah smells like victory because it's my sleeve okay that was really trash talking there but and i'm going to go on the back of this sheet fairly liberally i'm going to get most of the outside here i'm not going to really stress it because i'm really going to seal it and remember the dye is going to come off so check that out so um, rub it down first and then really make sure it gets a sealing coat, tan coat, or whatever you're using to seal. You do what you want to do. Um, Chuck Burroughs uses tan coat. Paul Long uses tan coat as far as I know on most of it. Now don't give me on all their applications, but on their basic sheaths, tan coat. Um, Ian Atkinson uses Carnuba wax as a, a underlayer, and then usually a, a different type of sealer, sealant. Again, made by Phoebe's Resistol. What is it? I forget what it's called. I haven't used it. I don't have any experience with it. Um, um, but I do not down talk their product for sure because I one I know it's, it's used in the industry a lot, and two, you can see the results they're getting. You know, if the customers are coming back and back and back and saying this is trash, that you know you got a problem but I don't see that with those guys' product at all. Ian's got an Etsy store, you know, sells just fine. He works at a college as well. Kind of weird, but he's a IT guy. Talked to him just a little bit on email and stuff. Real soft-spoken dude. You know, self-taught as well. And has really struggled to learn his, I mean, not struggle, but like, worked hard to learn his craft so check out his page i'll make sure i'll link him up too all right so we're gonna let that dry out just a little bit a little bit it's getting a little bit um 
tacky right now. I don't mean like <laughs> tasteless. I just mean um, a little bit sticky. Turn on my fan here. I'll put that down there to dry, and while I'm waiting for that one to dry, I'll put a little tan coat on here. This this is pretty much done. Actually, before I do that, how many times have I said that in this video series? Before I do that, I will do a little bit of edging again. Still back and forth, and I just knock that back. What happens when you add um, dye or any um, uh, liquid to your leather after you have edged it is it raises the grain you know I don't know if you need to do any woodwork if you're doing fine woodwork you get down and you're sanding down and they say add a little bit of water to raise the grain it does and you knock that back then you seal and usually you do light sanding to knock back the grain again it's just like that this is um, you know a natural material so it stands up a little bit knock this back this is again worn 400 grit I'll probably jump up to a thousand grit if I can find it yeah there's one and then I will use the magic dope again finishing is what separates the big kids from the little kids so take your time here just putting that back on my chest which is where I normally put it but I took it right out of camera okay so we're glazing that back up we're going to go in a single direction, lay those down. We haven't added any liquid to this now. Once it's been dyed, we're going to try to keep liquid away from it. We don't want the dye to soften, run, things like that. I shouldn't say run. It's not like it's paint. It doesn't run. It just comes off a little more than it should. Thousand grit. I found with thousand, you can just go in both directions. It's such a fine grit. And see how that's getting shiny right away? That's starting to look good. And we're going to our special sauce, baby. The super secret, not so secret. Everybody tends to use it, but I've found it works really well, good. Uh, thing to put on the edges, which is that was open. No, no, not so secret. A lot of different people out there use a lot of different methods for edging. I encourage you to try them all and get what works for you. I know a dude who's just swearing, I don't use anything but saliva. Like, I don't know, I guess he's just spitting on all of this stuff, but he gets good products, so I don't care. I don't care if you're using, you know, Bidoof blood or a little Pokemon reference there. Whatever you're using. Okay, so we set that aside. Feeding saddle soap. Uh, you can, I just tend to use Feeding's products just because I've never had trouble with them. They seem to be very good quality. So I'm sure there are other, other saddle soaps out there. And if you've got some from doing some boots or whatever, give them a try. I would stay away from the yellow saddle soap if you're not going to dye it. Because yellow tends to leave a little bit of yellow. I don't know that actually for sure. Because when I start buying my saddle soap, I asked Paul. <laughs> What color, Paul? Because I saw two, and he said, white, brother. He's like 80 years old. So I listened to Paul. He was around when leather was invented. He was like, God, I need to make a sheath. Make me an animal. I'm sure he, he, I, he didn't say that. Okay. Jeans. Blue jean material or... Uh... Here we go. No, that's more than jean. Uh, canvas works just fine. A drop cloth, the smallest drop cloth you can get from um, Home Depot. Get that and it would work just fine. This is just old old bed sheet. That's what Paul swears by. Get something that has a little bit of um, uh, resistance to it. A little bit of, I'm looking for a word there, abrasiveness to it. Uh, I just take old pieces of blue jean. You see I've done this quite a bit. Um, because you're, you're burnishing. Now what does that mean? That's got the word burn in it. So you are adding heat to it and you're also adding pressure. Now there's a bunch of different ways. The old Al Stolman ways put it up against the edge of something so you don't crush it, but you want to pinch it in such a fashion that it matches the round that you've already created. Now we're, we're basically there, man. We've got a really good looking 
edge right now, so it's not going to take long to make it look even better. So I'm going to, and it's going to take a little some practice, but notice how that channel fits immediately right there. Give it a little bit of heat and a little bit of speed, not a ton, you don't need to be all going cray cray. And you know, trying to start a fire. It's a root word burn, not a real word. Go back and forth, and then the dangler is quite a bit easier because I've got you know one plane. I can set it right on the edge of my block, my machinist block here. Um, and I gotta remind myself to tell you why I use a machinist block. Okay, man. Okay, so now let's look at the difference between you know our starting thickness and that. Isn't that crazy? You can really see. I hope you can. You can really see how that's been rounded. It's been dyed. Uh, you know, that's starting to, it's so soft. It's it's harder and smoother than, than our grain side, which is a very, very good thing. Now we do have to dye this again, just briefly, because in the sanding and burnishing process, that's gotten a little lighter. I actually like that look. It looks mottled and I think that it looks natural. I tend to leave those, but um, to go a true finished edge, you want to dye it again. Usually, you kind of want that to be one shade darker. Not the dye, but the edge. And it tends to be that when you get done. I found, though, that saddle soap on green um, will resist leather a little bit. Or it takes just, a, it's just not the same. Um, or it changes how the dye is accepted. So I don't put saddle soap on until I'm just doing my edges. This all has to be dyed. It can get nice and glossed up and cleaned up, which saddle soap does, right? But I don't want it to resist my dye, okay? So that's what I do there. And so we're gonna do an edge sealant here, or an edge uh, dye, and then we're going to seal it. And we could just use tan coat, that would be fine. We're gonna seal it with something else, okay? Doing good. All right. Set that aside. 